So with that, I would like to introduce uh, William Bialik um, on the first uh, presentation on an introduction uh, to system thinking. He is the uh, John Archibald Willer Patel Professor in Physics, a director of the Thomas Jones uh, Professor of Mathematical Physics program at Princeton University. And if you uh, want to see more about his bio, uh, he's on the actually um, papers or files that came with this uh, workshop for you. Uh, please welcome Bill Yalek. Very good. Um, so uh, I have the responsibility of providing you with an introduction. Um, it, it's a very broad topic. Uh, as as uh, Claudia said, I'm, I'm a theoretical physicist. I've been interested in, in biological problems for my entire career. Um, but this is still quite some distance from uh, the problems of medicine. Um, nonetheless, I hope that I can uh, give you some sense uh, for uh, at least what I and some community of uh, like-minded people uh, think of as, um, as systems thinking. And so maybe I should just plunge right in. Um, this slide also uh, uh, does double duty. It has content, but it also uh, presents the, the challenge of this short talk of trying to give you both a very high level overview and also um, to get down to the level where I convince you that there are real examples where these ideas work. Because I don't want to just I don't want to just stay at the at, at the abstract level. So um, as I think you all know, um, one of the great triumphs of uh, of 20th century science really um, is the uh, identification of the build molecular building blocks of life. And if anything, this uh, process of uh, exploration at the molecular level has accelerated in the 21st century, uh, thanks to our ability to do things, not one molecule at a time, but, but genome-wide. Um, the problem is a problem that we've known about for a very long time. And it's a problem that was articulated um, in this uh, marvelous uh, paper called More is Different by my late colleague, Phil Anderson. Um, and the historical context of that paper was very interesting, was, was an interesting one. Um, but there, there's a marvelous quote, um, which is that the reductionist hypothesis does not by any means imply a constructionist one. That is to say, just because we found all of the building blocks of something doesn't mean that you understand how to put them back together and recover the behavior at the macroscopic level that we were interested in in the first place. And I think Phil's concerns in this lecture were really conceptual about the nature of the relationships uh, between, between the different sciences, but it's really a very practical concern as we try and understand living systems. And, and to give you an example of this, let's imagine that we have some process which is um, controlled by uh, a genetic network and, uh, and actually we're fortunate that we've identified all of the genes in this network. And through generations of work, we even know about the interactions between the genes. We know that many of these genes encode transcription factors, which regulate the expression of other genes in the network. And this isn't, uh, as many of you know, this is not a hypothetical uh, situation. It's the real situation uh, for uh, many simpler processes. Um, and in increasingly for more and more processes, even in mammalian cells. But I wanna focus on, on one of the classic examples, which are the very early events in the development of fruit flies, which was one of the first places where it was possible to identify all the relevant molecules. And so the way this process works is that, um, well, the way it works along one axis of the, of the embryo, the long axis, is that the mother, when she makes the egg, uh, places uh, sources of crucial molecules at the ends, um, which then uh, uh, turn into uh, gradients um, mo of molecules, high concentration near the head, low concentration near the tail, another molecule that's the other way around, and yet a third molecule which marks the ends of the embryo. Um, all of these things are molecules that control gene expression, either directly as transcription factors or indirectly as signaling molecules. They feed into a network um, of genes which also encode transcription factors which control one another. And then these are called gap genes um, because if you're missing one of them, then the, the final pattern of, of the body plan has a gap in it. Um, and they, these feed into a set of molecules called the pair rule genes. And uh, to 
at, at, a, at a sort of colloquial level, it's a little bit more complicated than this. The striped patterns of expression of the pair rule genes provide a blueprint for the segmented body plan of the organism that hatches from the embryo and crawls away. Let me emphasize that to get from maternal inputs to pair rule genes takes three hours. So this is all fast and you can observe it in the laboratory and you now have incredible tools for monitoring all of these processes. Um, and the larva walks away after 24 hours. So this is a marvelous um, laboratory um, for studying these processes. So um, not only do we know what all these molecules are, do we know something about all these arrows and so on, um, there's even been a Nobel Prize for finding all these molecules. So what's the problem? Why, why wouldn't you say you understand how things work? And the reason is that if you try to take this sketch and turn it into a model that would actually make quantitative predictions, then every time you draw an arrow, you have to attach at least two numbers to it. So for example, if, if what the arrow means is that one transcription factor is controlling um, the expression level of another gene, then um, you have to tell me at what concentration is the effect of that control process half maximal? So what's the threshold for turning things on? And then how sharp is the threshold? And whenever you have two arrows come together, there's even more complexity hidden there because you have to tell me how you combine those signals. And in principle, that could be an arbitrarily complex function. We don't imagine that it is, but you have to tell me something. So the result is that if you wanted to turn this sketch, which is perhaps one of the best understood small genetic networks in all of biology into a model that actually has predictive power, you need to tell me 50 numbers or more. And we just don't know all of those 50 numbers. And so what I would say is that this is, this is the block that, that Anderson was talking about, that just because you can do the reductionist exercise of showing me that these are all the components that come together to build the pattern of the fly embryo, doesn't mean that you can actually do that building back. You found all the pieces, but putting them back together faces this enormous obstacle, which in, faces many obstacles. But in particular, there's this problem that, care, that actually doing that would involve knowing a very large number, doing this straightforward way would involve knowing a very large number of parameters. And in many ways, your reaction to this proliferation of parameters allows you to sort of classify the kind of work that you see in the field, certainly from the point of view of a physicist, but I think also from the point of view of systems biology and so on. And there are many different reactions um, ranging from, um, well, you know, the, the most pessimistic one, uh, sorry, let me uh, get back here. The most pessimistic one was, you know, it really is that complicated, tough luck. Um, the positive version of that is that what quantitative biology really means is to learn these complex models from limited data. And there's of course deep mathematical problems associated with that, but that's a very different, that's a very particular view of what it is that we would be trying to do. At the opposite end of this is an approach that I'm gonna focus on today. Um, not that all of these things aren't interesting, but it's 15 minutes. And so I wanna give you one example that I can push all the way down to be concrete. Um, and that is that there's some principle at the system level that actually, that in effect selects the parameters. And of course, what this is a, uh, an, uh, an encoding of is the idea that there's some aspect of how well the entire system functions, which is being selected for by evolution. And if we understand that selection process, we can reach that, we can circumvent knowing all of the parameters and instead ask about networks that perform that function um, as well as we see it to be performed. And so that's the, that's the approach I wanna talk about. And um, uh, in the same way that my experimentalist colleagues are gonna show you uh, schematics of, of large scale experiments, I'll show you a little schematic mathematics um, just so that, and I, I think in both cases, uh, the role of these uh, sketches is to let you know that there's something concrete underneath um, rather than to carry you through all the steps. So here's an idea um, which might or might not be right at the system level. And that is that in order to, for every cell in the embryo to make decisions about what part of the body it is going to become in the final pattern, um, it needs information. In particular, it needs information about where it is in the embryo. And we know that actually it has an enormous amount of information. Every cell knows where it is to 1% accuracy because if you look at the positioning, the precision of which developmental events are reproducible from embryo to embryo, it is that level of precision. 
Um, and in fact, since that happens, since that information is available at three hours into development, and at three hours into the development, there are fewer than 100 rows of cells along the length of the embryo. What that's telling you is that essentially every cell knows where it is um, along the length of the embryo. You couldn't do better than that. So you need to squeeze all that information out of those signaling molecules. And the problem is that those signaling molecules are present at relatively low concentrations. And that means that any measurement of their concentration is going to be noisy. And so how is it that you manage to, so one thing you could say is, well, maybe what the cell, you know, the cell should get out of this and just make more molecules, make the problem easier. But another view is, well, given how many molecules it actually makes, there's pressure to squeeze as much information as possible out of this. And what's important here is that this vague notion of squeezing as much information as possible out is something that we can make mathematically precise in a unique way, because we know from Shannon that there is a unique way of measuring our intuitive concept of information. And of course, this is the foundation for um, uh, the technology that we're actually using right now as we communicate with one another, um, but it's also conceptually very important. And so one can trace through all of the steps of asking if I have an input and an output, how much information does one give about the other? And you could say, well, I can't do anything to, to improve that information. Um, in particular, if the output is a noisy version of the input, then you're stuck. But that's not quite true because it turns out that the information doesn't just depend on what the noise level is. It also depends on what is the distribution of signals that you're actually trying to push through this input-output device. So one way of thinking about it is that if the concentrations of the input molecules were always very low, and the input-output device only turns on at a high concentration, then it would always be off and you wouldn't transmit any information and it doesn't matter what the noise level is. So if you wanna squeeze as much information through the system as possible, there's a notion of matching um, your input-output relationship, the noise level and the distribution of inputs. And this goes back at least um, to uh, the ideas of Simon Laughlin now 40 years ago who thought about this in the context of vision and argued that the input-output relationships of neurons in the fly's retina were actually matched to the distribution of input light intensities that the, that the insect encounters as it flies through the world. And in fact, this idea uh, gave birth um, to a whole series of things in the context of neuroscience, arguing that neurons have to have adaptation mechanisms or more precise, well, in some cases, they have to have adaptation mechanisms that we didn't, we didn't know about but more broadly, that the adaptation phenomena that we know about in the nervous system can be understood as accomplishing this kind of matching. Um, but what I wanna talk about today is whether you can do this for a genetic regulatory element. One of, one of those pieces of the um, picture that I drew for you in the fly embryo, and so let's go back to the fly embryo. You can do experiments in which you measure simultaneously in every cell, um, well, in half of the embryo, since you're looking down on it here. You can measure the concentration of one of the input molecules, those maternal signals. You can measure the concentration of the of one of the output or the intermediate molecules, one of the gap genes, and you see this sort of classic sigmoidal relationship on average, but importantly, because you have thousands of samples, you characterize not only the average input-output relationship, but also the noise in the system. And then you can ask if you wanted to be sure that an input-output relationship that had this, in, that an input-output device that had this relationship between input concentration, output concentration, and this level of noise transmits as much information as possible, you could adjust, you could imagine adjusting the distribution of input concentrations so that you push as much information through this as possible. If you do that and solve that problem numerically, and there are now no free parameters, right? Because you're, I've given you a picture of what the distributions of what these things look like, and now you try to squeeze as much information through this as possible, you uh, predict that the distribution of output molecules should have this double peaked form, which nonetheless has uh, some occupation of the intermediate levels. And the red here is the theory with no free parameters, and the black is what you measure experimentally. Um, and this was one of the first signs that this whole vision of uh, squeezing as much information out as possible um, made sense. Um, and, you know, the agreement is quite good considering, again, there's no adjustable parameters here. The theory is telling you that different aspects of the data are related to one another. In order to keep going down this path, 
you have to figure out how to deal with the fact that there are um, several, uh, that there are many inputs and many outputs. And unfortunately, um, uh, my screen just stopped sharing. So I'm gonna have to do that again. So let me keep talking while I say this. Um, the idea is that you have many inputs and many outputs, um, but the information that you care about is the information about position. And, um, and so uh, you can trace everything back um, to information about position. Um, and in doing this, you get more predictions about how the system should behave. Um, and finally, you can sort of unfold these ideas. Um, I realize that I'm, I'm right at the edge here. Uh, you can unfold these ideas and make more explicit the algorithms that you need to use in order to read out the information that's encoded in all of these um, on, in all of these expression levels, and what you find is that if you um, use all of the gap genes, you can finally get down to one percent precision and no ambiguities left in your readout. Um, and then what's remarkable is that you can test this using the power of Drosophila genetics by going to mutants in which you've deleted some of the maternal inputs and then predict in some sense, you can use these algorithms to read what a cell, where a cell thinks it is in the mutant and predict then where the pair rule stripes should be. And there are lots of mutants and lots of stripes and amazingly you get them all right and there are no free parameters. So what, I'm sorry that this was a bit rushed, but what I wanted to convince you of is that by injecting system level principles, which in some sense are top down as opposed to the uh, reductionist bottom up approach, um, we can get quantitative predictions, which sort of entirely go around the problem of knowing all of those 50 parameters. The problem with this is that, um, is that uh, our most powerful experimental tools are at the microscopic level, not the system level. And so the challenge is now the inverse of the challenge that we started with, that's sort of hopeless to go all the way from the bottom up to the, to the full system level uh, macroscopic behavior. And the question now is whether we can use these top-down principles and get them to reach all the way down into the molecular details. Thank you.